Welcome to the Family Sabbath School. We are excited to be here in the Philippines uh, sharing with you Sabbath School as a family. Uh, we do this uh, in uh, Alabama, where I'm from. We've been doing this for four years. So we want to share with you what we've been learning all week long as families together. Uh, worshiping God morning and evening and all through the day. The topic, the Bible topic for this week has been the resurrection. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if I could have the, we want to uh, do the memory verse. I don't have the music though set up, but maybe we could sing it. Um, a cappella. Could I have the speakers come up and we could sing the memory verse. 1 Corinthians 15 20. Uh huh. You can't do it. Lydia LaJewel and the children and Carla. All right, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 20. You want me to recite it with them? Yes, recite okay. it. Uh -huh. Okay, so you can follow, repeat after me, or we can try to say it all together. I'll give you the first word. It says, but now is Christ risen. Okay, ready? But, but now, now is Christ, Christ risen from, from the, the dead, dead and, and become, become the, the first fruits of them that slept. that slept. First Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now is Christ risen. First Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now is Christ risen. First Corinthians 15, 20. All right. And before the children go down, I, uh, you can step here too. Kevin isn't here, so maybe you could hold his. We have been studying this week a lot about health and anatomy and physiology. And that's one of the first subjects our children need to be learning. So I want to show you what Camille and Kayla and Kevin have done this week. And uh, Camille, could you take this gold thread and just pull it? Pull it hard, good. And now let's open this up and let's hold it up so that people can see what you've been doing. They have their names on here and the first one, maybe mother can help and you can stand to the side here, Cadmiel. This one is, it's got Cadmiel's name on it. I think brother has helped to draw the brain and then to color it. That's Cadmiel's first um, anatomy and physiology lesson by drawing. This is a traced image of his body. And so that's the first vital organ that uh, he has placed on his body. And he's got his name up here. So he's four years old. Is that a good time to be learning anatomy and physiology? Yes. All right. Let's uh, give this to Lydia LaJewel. All right, and here's Kayla. Kayla doesn't have any body organs on there yet, but she's thinking about it and she's working on it. All right, but her body is traced on here and here is her name. The name is very important. Okay, here's Kevin, so here's the next one. There's Kevin. Now, Kevin is nine years old 
And what Kevin did is he took the picture of the brain and the heart, I believe, and put them behind this paper and then traced it. Trace the brain, trace the heart. And then he put in the details and colored. So this is typically what a nine-year-old could do. And you want to make it such that it's for the, the level that they are. And uh, so here they have that we can we have these hanging on the wall so they can look at it and then throughout the week they can be thinking about what's the next body organ or let's say bone or muscle that they'll put on their bodies. And uh, so this is one way that you can encourage them to focus on learning about their bodies and how they work. All right. I have just a little bit more of this ta this uh, paper, so um, I, I, I would like to invite all of you children to be able to do this, but we're going to let you, during the health talk, go ahead and draw the digestive system, so you'll be thinking about how you want to do that, all right? All right, thank you all. This is wonderful. And before you go back down, I want you children to help me. Uh, show the other children something else. <clears throat> All right. We have a commission, don't we? All of us. And that's to take something to the whole world. We have a gift to take to the world. I have a map here. This is a, a nice cloth map that's big. And it's good for children. They can sit on it. It can be placed on the wall. Let's make sure it's not upside down. All right, let's hold it there. And um, we're going to hold it really up high, so maybe over the children. There we go. So here's a map of the world. So they can begin learning geography right off when they're young and early. And the Bible says in Isaiah that we learn by here a little and there a little, precept upon precept and line upon line. So the children can be shown like um, here you are in the Philippines and we've come, and Lydia LeJewel is going to point out where we've come from, the United States, Alabama. So one of the first things I did when I was told, you know, we want you to come to the Philippines, I went right to my large map to find out where you all were. And um, we are so grateful to be here. But this is a way you can teach your children uh, geography early on. All right? All right, thank you. Let's fold it up neatly. Yes. Character quality. Our character quality this week is neatness. Right. Very good. Thank you so much. All right. You can go back down to your seats now. So, in Family Sabbath School, we review our memory verse. We've been singing it every day, morning and evening when we have our worship. And children learn best. They teach us how to learn. When they ask questions, they ask why a lot, don't they? Or you tell them a story and they say, tell me that story again. They like to have repetition and it is truly by repetition that we learn best. So if you hear something one time, there's a pathway in the brain that begins, it starts, but then the next time you hear it, that pathway gets deeper. And the next time it gets deeper, and so this is one way habits are formed as well. When you hear something, hear instruction, and you do it, a pathway is set up in the, the mind or the brain. And then it becomes easier and easier to do it until it's a habit. And when a good trait of character is a habit, you don't have to think about it so much. You just do it. Your body just knows the steps and it does it automatically. The same thing though happens when you have learned a bad trait of character. There's a pathway that begins and every time you do that bad character trait, 
that pathway grows deeper and deeper and it becomes harder and harder to break that bad habit. And so the way that you break a bad habit though, we hope that no one has any bad habits here, <laughs> but of course m so many of us do. But the way you break a bad habit is to inculcate or add, this is mathematics, add to your life what is right. And even though you may not like it, it not feel good, the more you do what is right, the easier it will become as it becomes a habit that you no longer will complain about it. So if, if you're complaining about things that you have to do that are good and right, just know that you haven't done them enough. <laughs> All right. That's what we want. We want to be able to do what's right and have it a habit so that it's a part of our character. All right. What do you see up there on the screen? Do you see anything? What is that? A lamb. Is that what was used as a symbol to represent Jesus? It was. Remember John the Baptist when he saw Jesus, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Why was the Lamb represented as Jesus? What's a Lamb like? <laughs> Sweet. Pardon? It's meek. meek. It's meek. Very good. Is it a follower? Yeah. Yes, it follows a shepherd. And if there's not a shepherd, there is a sheep that's called a leader sheep that leads the sheep. So what we want to educate our children to be is leaders, don't we? Leaders. We want them to be leaders to show the sheep out there. Uh, God has many out there that he wants to follow him. The whole world, he wants to follow him. And so he's asking the church to develop leaders, leader sheep, to lead the sheep. All right, leader sheep. So Jesus came and he grew like all the little children are growing here. He had parents that were chosen to help him develop leadership qualities as well as his Father in Heaven and the Holy Spirit. There are many, many other symbols that represent Jesus, but this is the main one that we're going to be focusing on today, the sheep. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Our Bible lesson this week, we're taken from these three Gospels, Matthew 27, 57 to, through 28, chapter 28, verse 8. Hey, there's two eights. We're going to be focusing on number eight uh, today in our lesson review. The other gospel is Luke 24, 1 through 12. And John 19, 31 to chapter 20, verse 18. All right. Those are the Bible uh, scriptures where our lesson was taken from and on Sabbath we're reviewing and doing activities to test those who have studied the lesson and many of you who may ha know the lesson uh, so that Sabbath is interactive. We're not just giving a lecture. Uh, we are being interactive because we're reviewing, okay? So just to start with um, it starts out our lesson with, at last Jesus was at rest. He had been crucified. He had been taken down from the cross very gently, we're told, by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. His body was treated very carefully. And Joseph of Arimathea gave Jesus his tomb. Jesus had no place to be buried. And Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man, and this was his tomb for his body. But he gave it to Jesus because he was convicted that Jesus was the Son of God. And so Jesus 
at last was at rest. Was Jesus' life here on earth all pleasure and amusement and pleasant, was it? Or did he carry the cross? We're told he carried the cross from the cradle to the grave. Carrying the cross. And we've had a little instruction from Dr. Boutte this morning and throughout the week on what it means to carry the cross. When what you want to do, especially as little children, if you want to do something and mother and father say no, that's a cross. And children are to say, okay, and lay down their life. Jesus is number one. God is number one. The cross is when we lay down our will and take up God's will. It's not my will that I'm doing what I do. It should be the Father's will. In the home, it should be the Father's will and the Mother's will. And hopefully, mother and father are bearing the cross as well and doing what God calls them to do. When we don't bear the cross, remember the cross now is the number one. If we don't bear the cross, we're saying, I'm number one. So we're making man the idol. And so bearing the cross is laying down what I want for what God wants, for what my parents want. The cross. Jesus bore the cross from the cradle to the grave. The world recognizes, much of the world recognizes Jesus dying on the cross. But to bring that into the daily practical life, that is another story. And so that's why we've been here this week, to help you, especially as parents, see how important it is to teach your children to bear the cross from the cradle to the grave. And we've been told this morning, they'll be happier. And Jesus, though it was hard to carry that cross, in, the, in Gethsemane he said, he prayed to his father, let this cup pass for me. Three times he said that. He, it was hard for Jesus, but he was strengthened by his father's strength, by divinity. And so Jesus was able to bear that cross all the way to the grave. So Jesus was placed in the grave before the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath he rested. The Son of God lay in quietude in Joseph's tomb. That's another thing we've learned this morning. The home, in the home it should be a restful place. It should be a quiet place not a place where we're running and boisterous and noisy. And even on the Sabbath, it should be a day of rest, of quietness. And there Jesus lay. His work completed, his hands folded in peace. He rested through the sacred hours of the Sabbath day. Peace and quietude. Those who take Christ at his word and surrender their souls to his keeping, their lives to his ordering, will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad by his presence. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. The Lord says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee, Isaiah 26, 3. Our lives may seem a tangle. And there was a large, uh, not large, but a long rope that I was untangling before this meeting so that we could use it to help us demonstrate something. But the Lord was showing me, oh, when things are all tangled up and in confusion, how difficult it is to take time to unravel it all. And so this is the time in which we're living, a time called Babylon, confusion. And so if you're feeling like a little confused, God wants to unravel that tangled up confusion. And he can do that as you seek him with your whole heart. Our lives may seem a tangle, but as we commit ourselves to the wise master worker, he will bring out the pattern of life and character that will be his own glory. 
and that character which expresses the glory character of Christ will be received into the paradise of God. A renovated race shall walk with him in white for they are worthy. And it's beautiful to be here at this camp. There's a lot of renovation taking place that can remind us of our great need to have renovated lives and how beautiful it has become as we've watched uh, it be transformed in this week, a little here, a little there, making it a little more comfortable for us, a little more beautiful, a little more orderly and neat. And so that is what God wants us to do. All right. Now we're going to go into that character quality that we've been uh, looking at this week. And uh, my daughter, Kimberly, is going to come up and um, we're going to take a look at that, the character quality. Our character quality is? Neatness. Neatness, that's right. Neatness. And I want to go through the definition with you. Again, to the left of the screen, we have the definition of neatness. And then to the right, we have objects. And since I didn't have all these objects on hand, I just have the words. So you can picture the object in your mind. And we need to match these objects with the definition. You think you can do that? I know you can. All right, the first definition of neatness is exact cleanliness. Which object do you think would go with exact cleanliness? Honey, bracelet, water, teeth, or laundry? Which one could remind us of exact cleanliness? Laundry. Laundry? Okay, I can see how you would say that. And there's no wrong answer, really. You can tie each of these in it. But I picked another one, and I heard it out here. I picked water because we need water to clean our bodies on the inside as well as on the outside. So we can't have exact cleanliness without water. So I picked that. All right, the next definition is freedom from ill-chosen and <coughs> impure, sorry about the typo, impure words. Which object? Let's see the objects again. Is it the honey, the bracelet, the teeth, or the laundry? Teeth. teeth. Okay, I can see why you would say that because our words come out of our mouth. But there's another one I picked. Think about what Proverbs tells us about our words. Honey, honey that's right. If our words are reflecting our character quality of neatness, then they're going to be sweet, just like honey is. And that's what we want. So when you see honey, next time you see honey, you can think about how God wants our words to be pure and well-chosen. All right, the next definition of neatness is freedom from useless ornaments. Which object? Bracelet. The bracelet. Yes, that one was pretty obvious. The next definition is orderliness. Which object? What? Teeth. Why? Because they're orderly, right? God created <laughs> our teeth orderly. And because of sin, sometimes we don't have orderly teeth anymore. But praise the Lord that his original plan was that they would all be orderly. So when you see someone with a beautiful smile, what can you think of, children? Orderliness and neatness. That's what God wants in our lives. Our last definition is tidiness. So which object? Laundry. Laundry. <laughs> That's right. Laundry. So we have some things over here. Do you see anything that is not demonstrating neatness? Do you see anything that isn't neat? Yes? What is it? How about the shoes over here? Do you think they're neatly 
neatly uh, set here? No, they're just kind of thrown. How many times do you children run into the house and you just take your shoes off and any way they fly, you just leave them there and go running? Is that the way we want to be? No, we don't. We want neatness in our lives. So I'm going to ask my mom to fix that for me since it's hard for me to get down there. So we're going to make them neat. What else over here is not neat? The clothes, right. When you are done with the day, children, and you're in your room and you're changing your clothes, putting your pajamas on, what do you do with those clothes when you're done with them? Do you just throw them on the floor like this is just thrown there? I hope not, because we want to be neat, right? So we're going to take that shirt and we're going to fold it. In our Sabbath school lesson, the Bible portion of it, it talked about Jesus when he was raised from the dead. And he was anxious to go and see his father. He hadn't seen his father in heaven face to face for over 30 years. And so it was a, a wonderful event that was going to take place, but he didn't neglect his duty. And his first duty was to take those cloth, that cloth that was wrapping him up, and he folded it neatly in its, and put it in its place. And that was a testimony for us that God is concerned with the little things. Even when you run into the house, you take your shoes off to set them in order. And when you change your clothes, not to just drop them, but to fold them and put them where they need to go. Neatness. I told a story this week about our words. Do you remember that story about Patsy and Susan? The importance of having pure words. Well, I want to share with you another story that demonstrates neatness in the area of freedom from useless ornaments. And this story is entitled Jane's Jewels. Jane was a little girl who had people make fun of her because she wasn't as beautiful, they thought, as them. And she had a simple dress. She didn't have any special things about her dress or that she could put on or put in her hair. And she felt like she wasn't beautiful. Well, every day she would pass a store and in the store's window, she would see some bracelets and some pearl necklaces and she really wanted those. She thought that if she could just get those she would be beautiful. Well one day she finally had enough money and she went into that store and she bought a few bracelets and that pearl necklace and she put it on and she felt so good. And she went home and she went about her day and she was just so thrilled that finally she could be beautiful. Well, it wasn't too long after purchasing those ornaments that the pearl necklace broke and all the beads fell onto the floor. And then that bracelet that she had started to turn color and she would rub it, but it wouldn't go back to its shiny color. And one evening she was laying in bed and feeling like she had lost something precious and her mother came to her to say good night and before she said good night she spoke a few words to her and she said Jane what is it that makes someone beautiful is it what's on the outside or is it something else she thought for a minute and then her mother said, you know, Jane, it's not the jewels that you wear on the outside, but it's the jewels that you have on the inside that really make you beautiful. It's the jewels of kindness, of thoughtfulness that shine out and draw others to Jesus. And when, if you will put those jewels on the inside, you will always be beautiful. And that's so true. We're told in 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10, 
In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest appar <coughs> apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Mothers, make yourselves as attractive as possible. But then it defines what that is. Not by elaborate trimming, but by wearing clean, well-fitting garments. Thus, you will give to your children constant lessons in what? Neatness and purity. By how we dress, by how we adorn ourselves, we can be those living sermons to society and to our children, keeping before them the qualities that God wants them to have in their lives. Neatness is indispensable, we're told. Indispensable. Neatness is essential. Neatness is important. And neatness is an honor to God. I don't have time to tell you the next story, but if you want to hear it later, I can share it with you. But we're told Christians will be judged by the fruit they bear. The true child of God will be neat and clean. While we are to guard against needless ornament and display, we are in no case to be careless and indifferent in regard to outward appearance. All about our persons and our homes is to be neat and attractive. The youth are to be taught the importance of presenting an appearance above criticism, an appearance that honors God and the truth. And remember our scripture from Deuteronomy 23, 14? We talked about it all week long, and I want to end with that before we go on to the rest of our lesson. Deuteronomy 23, 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. Jesus wants to dwell with us. And he says that if your camp is holy, if your camp is neat, if your home is in order, then he will come and abide with you. All right. Um, here's a text from Job 17:13. Who is this speaking of? If I wait, the grave is mine house. I have made my bed in the darkness. Who is this speaking about? Who made their grave in the darkness? If I wait, did God, did Jesus wait for the appointed time to die? There was a time appointed for him to die. This is speaking of Jesus. The grave is mine house. I have made my bed in the darkness. It's from Job. It's speaking about him as well. <clears throat> All right, who is this? Isaiah 53, 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Who is that? Jesus. All right. How was Jesus shown respect and death? John 19.39 tells us, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred weight, hundred pound weight, which equals about 72 pounds. So a hundred pound in weight um, reminded me of another hundred that was uh, used to help seal the tomb when Jesus was in the tomb. It was a hundred what? Placed at the tomb. Here we have a stone to remind us of that sealed tomb. Who was placed around that tomb to keep Jesus there? 100 soldiers. So there was 100 pounds of um, spices. That's a lot of spices to embalm the body. And 100 soldiers. So there we have 100 <clears throat> as a math problem so it can help us to remember. Every day a Christian fights with death as he strives against sin for every power that tries to tear him from the Savior is in truth the power of the grave. And I don't know if you feel this, but we feel it every day, that fight with death. 
<clears throat> striving, sin striving to gain the ascendancy. All right, what did Jesus, what day did Jesus rise from the dead? Give me a number. First, I hear first and eight. Are you both right? Yes. So the first day of the week, Jesus rose, that's Sunday. But it's also considered the eighth day, the eighth day. And so we're going to take a look a little bit at the number eight. And we're going to have our first family come up. And um, <clears throat> like them to come up and they can come right up here. This week we learned a little bit about what's in the bag. And we learned what the different colors of the rainbow represent. And also in the second grade to eighth grade program uh, for homeschooling, the academic subjects are color coded by color. And so how many of you can remember what the red represents spiritually? What is it? Blood or sacrifice. All right, so blood or sacrifice, that can remind us of health also in our second grade to eighth grade program. Could you um, maybe have your young person uh, show us what is in the bag? Okay. All right. What is that? The heart, yes. And anything else in there? Oh, okay, there are, it, uh, there's a few other things in here. And what I'll have um, you do, what is your name? Jasper. Jasper, nice to meet you, Jasper. And your parents, your name is? Maria Fippo. Would you kind of say that in here? Maria Fippo. All right, and your husband is? Gab. Okay, thank you. All right, um, tell us what you have in the bag, the red bag. Okay, uh, comes out with the globe map. The, the globe. Yeah. All right, and this represents also health. Jesus came to show us and teach us about health. And where are we to take the health message? To the world. To the world. Yes, just like our Gospel Commission. It is a part of the Gospel Commission. So we're to take health to the uh, world. And you have um, a head here. And so we can learn in anatomy and physiology who reigns, who is to reign in our head. Who's the head of um, us as Christians? Jesus. That's right. So as we learn about our um, head and the different parts, uh, we are learning uh, to recognize order and neatness in our body temples. All right, and we have the heart, and what does the heart represent? Oh, here's a biscuit. Mm -hmm. um, what does the heart pump? Uh, for, for blood circulation. For blood and circulation. Yeah. That's right. So the blood, in the blood is life. And so here we have, um, in the health message, a way to keep our blood healthy. And we're told that it, perfect circulation means perfect health. So we need to know how to apply the eight laws of health. So that's what I have here, eight laws of health. Some people teach more, 10, 12, 15. But eight is our number for today that we want to remember. Could you, Jasper, go to our felt board over here and put those laws of health to the side. I'm going to put something in the middle. So you put those to the side so that we can see. And if you, yes, keep them like here and on that side. That would be very nice. All right. Thank you, uh, mother and father. Yes. Good. Thank you. So red sacrifice, um, the number of eight right here with health. Uh, that is something that God wants us to remember. And number eight is the first day of the week also. Jesus rose from the dead, and we're going to learn more when we get to math. Do you know what color represents math? 
Orange. Orange represents math. Thank you, Jasper, very much. Uh, orange represents math. We're going to get to that, and I think we're probably going to run out of time here, too. Um, eight, eight laws of health in the red bag. All right, yellow is the next one. If we could have the next family come up and show us what's in the yellow bag. Yellow also represents gold or divinity. And so we have in our school lessons for the second grade to eighth grade, yellow representing music. Music is a language that bypasses our frontal lobe, goes right into our body. All right, tell us your names. What's your name? Charis. Okay, thank you. Charis. And what is your name? Chris. And your last name? Floyd. All right, thank you. All right, could you show us what's in your yellow bag? What is this? What is that? Eye. An eye. Beautiful. What does the eye tell us? Let's find out. All right. Would would you like to take that back to your seat and look at it a little more? Mm -hmm. All right, you can. Yes, thank you. All right, you can go back to your seat. Thank you. So the eye. What does God tell us about the eye? Keep the eye single to the glory of God. And let's read the, the next story. We came to Russell Harbor, Australia, a small place, but quite interesting in appearance. Mountains were all around this place except where it was on the water side. This seemed to be the stopping place for most of the passengers. In approaching Russell, there were islands of rocks. And on the sides of the rocks were trees and vegetation, growing very high up. And as we thought we were going straight into the harbor, the anchor was cast, for a fog had settled down upon us. The captain said, we are caught in a fog, and I will not run any risks, for the peril may involve the boat and passengers. And we honored his judgment. For about one hour, the fog did not lift, and the sun did not penetrate it. Then the musicians who were to leave the boat at this place entertained the impatient passengers with music. Well selected and well rendered. It did not jar upon the senses as the previous evening. So they had a different type of music the, other, the previous evening. But was soft and really grateful to the senses because it was musical. Between eight and nine o'clock, the fog lifted. What time did the fog lift? Between eight and nine. There's our number eight again. This is to help remind us of this story. The sun had p penetrated through it and it was wonderful how rapidly the mo that the most of the fog was swept away, leaving the harbor clear and perfectly safe to be entered by the boat. It called to mind how many times this very symbol had been, symbol, had been realized in our Christian experience. We dared not venture in a mist and perplexity and were obliged to stand still and see the salvation of God. The words from the living oracles teach us when tried and tempted and surrounded with difficulties, the safe course for us to pursue is to patiently wait, to be of good courage and commit the keeping of the soul and body to God. You know, to the disciples, the death of Jesus was like a mist, a fog. They were perplexed. They had really lost their courage. It wasn't a pleasant experience for them until afterwards when the Holy Spirit fell 10 days later and they realized <clears throat> what had happened. And actually even before that because they did meet Jesus. So 
yellow. Now mathematics. What did Jesus rise what day did Jesus rise from the dead again? The eighth day. And let's have the next family come up and we'll look at the next bag. What is in the orange bag? Orange in our second grade to eighth grade program represents mathematics. It also represents judgment. So let's see if we can learn a little bit more about that number eight. And tell us your names and how old you are. How old? Are you? I just ten can ya. Okay, and how old are you? Six. Six. Okay, thank you. And your name? Maria Harty. Okay, say it in here. Maria Harty. All right, thank you. All right, would you pick up the orange bag? And let's see what's in there. What is it? Brain. Oh, the brain. Brains. The brain. That's a very special place in your body. And an atlas of the world. And some words. What do the words tell us? My body. My body is temple of Holy Spirit. Ah, so your body is a temple. And your brain, that's where you do mathematics. And you do reasoning. And that is considered the most holy place of the body. So you want to take care of that. Now let's, let's learn what the number eight means. And we can put these back in the bag. What is the number eight? Resurrection. The generation, the beginning of the new order or, or era. He who abounds in strength. One who abounds in strength. The number eight. So God can teach us lessons through colors and numbers. And Jesus raising from the dead, rising from the dead on the eighth day can remind us of regeneration. How many? Thank you. You can take that to your seat if you would like to and look at that. All right. And a little later, we're going to give you some paper so you can draw it. <clears throat> Mathematics. So, <clears throat> Jesus rising from the dead on the eighth day can remind us of regeneration. Regeneration, when you're sick, when you're very, very sick, and you learn that especially your, the body organ that's sick can be regenerated, does that bring you hope and renews your strength? It does. It does. If you learn that it cannot be regenerated, that's, that's a sad day. But God has made the body so that it will, in many respects, heal itself and be restored when we return to obedience to his laws. All right, mathematics, <clears throat> orange. And now we're going to go into our nature lesson. And um, what bag has something in it? Um, well, we'll go over that bag after our nature lesson. And Lydia LeJewel will be up to share with us our nature lesson. Our nature lesson this week was learning how to protect plants from what kind of weather? Cold. Yes, cold weather. And that was certainly a good lesson here where we could learn a lot. Do you have a lot of cold weather here? No, not too much. But what did we find out? Uh, what do you use? What kind of building do you use or do people use who are in cold weather who need to protect plants? A greenhouse. And what did we learn that a greenhouse is made out of? Yes. We learned oftentimes when we asked that it would be made out of plastic, right? And some tubes. Now, we learned a few different things about greenhouses and how to build them. So, I have plastic and tubes, so if I just go like that, do I have a greenhouse? No, why not? Do I need something else? Do I need a plan? 
Yes, I need a plan. So first we need a plan, and we need what was our character quality? Neatness. neatness. So is planning a part, or is neatness a part of a plan? Yes. So we learned that we need a plan, and we need neatness in building our greenhouse. Now, tell me, where should we? Once we have a plan, where do we build our greenhouse? In a shady spot or in a sunny spot? In a sunny spot. Why? What's the point? Yes, so that we get the the sunshine in our greenhouse. Because what do what do we need for seeds to grow? Some sunshine, warmth, and that's the point. We're protecting our plants from cold weather, so we're going to use the energy from the sun. Okay. Now, what can that? Who did some protecting in our lesson? Who protected Jesus's body? Do you remember their names? Nicodemus and whose tomb was he buried in? Joseph's tomb. So. We can remember when we're protecting our plants from different weather elements, be it cold or hot, that we can remember Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Now, we said that we need some plastic to build our greenhouse. Do you know what this bag is made out of? It's made out of plastic. It looks kind of like straw. But would this plastic work to build my greenhouse? Why not? <laughs> well, for a few reasons, but one of the major reasons is what color would you call a greenhouse normally? It's kind of like a transparent, right? What color is this? It's, yeah, it's white or transparent. And that reminds us that why why do we need it to be white or transparent? What needs to come through it? The sunlight. the sunlight, right. And so this can make us think of what? Where do the words of God, we call those seeds, right? The little seeds are the word of God. Where is it supposed to go? In our hearts. And if our heart is all covered up, and not transparent, then will the sunshine from the Lord come in? We need it to be transparent to God so that it can grow, right? We need to have transparency, just like our greenhouse, like we learned this week, that it's transparent. Now we learned some other things. We learned in planning our greenhouse that first we need, what happened? Um, what happened when Jesus died and when he rose and when he comes again? What's going to happen? Earthquake. An earthquake. And what do we need to have during an earthquake to make sure that our house doesn't topple over? The first thing. Foundation. A good foundation. foundation. So in making our plan, we're building a greenhouse. So we first, we have a plan. And the plan was... First, that we have all the tools that we need, our tubes and our plastic. Then we need a solid foundation. Now, the next thing in building our greenhouse is when we add the walls and we add the roof. We learned a little bit this week about what it should be like, what it should look like. And how did we learn that the most sunlight came in? What kind of look should our greenhouse have when we plant it? Okay, that we should have a slant. Yes. And we have an example of that here behind us. That is called a span roof. But there's another kind of greenhouse that you can build with tubes and plastic. And it's called a hoop house. And it is similar. It just kind of has a gradual curve to it. And it looks like a half of a hoop or a circle. And why is that the best kind? We learn that it's the best kind because the sun goes because it gets the most of what? Sun. Sun. And why why do we care? 
because we need the sunshine to get our plants to grow. So that's the point. But can we grow? Can we have other kinds of um, houses if we if we need it? If we can't build a whole one like that, what's the other kind called? And I don't think we talked about this word, but it's frame. called a lean-to, right? Mm -hmm. A lean-to is half of the slant, so if you cut the house in half, then you can just have that. Now, which direction should that lean-to be pointed towards? Where's the most sun? The south. Good, you are listening. The most sun is in the south because of the way the sun travels across the sky. It rises on which side? In the east, yes, and it sets where? In the west. So it travels across, and the south side of your house is usually the most exposed to the sunshine. And we learned that the plants tend to lean in what direction? In the direction of the sun. Yes. And we want, if we wanted straight plants, if we want straight lives, and straight Christians, the more sun exposure that we get, the straighter the, our plants in our lives will be. Now, we talked about one important thing as far as the whole point of a greenhouse is so that it stays warm, yes? But can it get too warm? Can it get too warm in here for your plants in the Philippines? Yes, and what happens when it gets too warm? We had an object lesson of plants getting too warm. What happens? They dry out. And so we need some kind of something. What do we need? We need shade, yes? For our sun, for our, for our greenhouse. And so you can use maybe an umbrella or... You could use a burlap sack or some kind of blanket to cover it. And what was something that was very bright in our story? Can somebody remember something very bright? Who was bright? Angel. The angels. And what did they do to cover some of their brightness? They came, did they appear like angels? No, they appeared like what? like two men and so they were shielding their brightness for the women so that the women would be able to handle it just like we there are angels all around us and we don't see them because they shield themselves because we can't handle it because we aren't now one other thing that was very important for our if it gets too hot what's one thing that we need Uh-oh. Well. <laughs> okay. It starts with a V. What's one thing that we need? Good ventilation. So you can do that with having a nice fan yes in your greenhouse you can't really see but there's little transparent propellers on our fan and so the last thing we need you can how big does a greenhouse have to be Sorry. what what size is a greenhouse 12 feet it can be any size right it can be anything from just the size to fit your uh, one plant or it can be as big as this tent but we have an example here. Oh, it, it ran away. It went over there. Of something, it could be as small as this. This is what a hoop house might look like. What is this called, really? <laughs> it's not a hoop house, is it? Yeah, it's a dish cam. So we have this, but this can remind us of it of because it has nice ventilation and it has a nice lid that's transparent and a place for our plants to go and all it needs now is some sunshine and some plants and that can remind us every time that you do your dishes of the greenhouse that maybe you don't really need one here because it's not cold but it can remind you of how also 
We are like those little seeds that need the protection, that need heat. We have special environments that we need. And in order to grow, we need to take care. And the children especially remind us of those little seeds. Now what happens? There are some places that grow little seedlings to uh, then be able to sell them. And people put them in their gardens, right? And so that can remind us that we are like those little, like our children are little seeds. And they're grown in our home and protected and sheltered, but they're not going to stay in our homes forever. One day they're going to grow and go out into the world, out into the gardens of the world and be planted and to be strong. So we want to start them with a good, um, uh, with a good place to start with, that they will be healthy and able to stand. But what is the biggest de uh, deterrent to having healthy plants in a greenhouse? We learned that in our lesson this week. What if it was too crowded? What if it was not kept up? What if the, the filth, what if it wasn't kept neat? And then what would happen? Disease would come. And so we need to make sure that our homes are kept clean of those impure words. And that will bring much of the happiness and the health to our home. So we don't want it to get crowded by useless things or things that would take from our time from the, what's most important so that those plants can grow. Okay, so that was our lesson review on, um, on greenhouses. And I will turn this back over. Thank you. All right, protecting plants from cold weather. Isn't that what Jesus did? He came to protect us from the coldness of sin. And he is our protection. He's risen from the dead. All right, uh, we ha can we have our next family come up and let's see what's in the green bag. The green bag. And then, Romelin, if you could get two more families uh, so that we can finish up as well. All right, let's see what's in our green bag. What does green represent? Are you glad that there's a lot of green around here? Yes, it shows what? Life? Life and hope. So yes, nature. Green represents nature and faith. We want our faith to be as green as the life that we see out there. All right, let's see. What are your names? Tell us your names and your age. I'm Rena. I'm RJ. How old? Seven years old. Seven. All right. Thank you. What's in your bag, your green bag? Lion. A lion. Could you take it out and show everyone? Yes. What, what does a lion remind you of? The king of the forest. Ah, the king. Yes. Was Jesus king? He was, but he didn't come to this earth to reign here as king, did he? He came instead of as a lion, and the lion does represent Jesus as king, but he came as what? What else do you have in your bag? Lamb. A lamb. And we've learned that a lamb shows us meekness. So a true king, a true father in the home is going to show meekness, meekness, and reign as King Jesus did as a lamb of God, still having those firm characteristics of the lion. All right. Thank you. You can set that down. Yes, very good. <clears throat> and you can return to your seats. All right, nature. What does his story teach us about loyalty? You know, history, true history, is truly his, Jesus' story. And so if there could be another family, I'm not sure if Romelin has appointed another family or not, uh, to let's show us what is in the blue bag. <clears throat> the blue bag 
This is what bag will tell us something about this quality that Jesus showed us by his life, death, and resurrection. So there's something in the blue bag that we learned from Jesus. Can we have someone come up? Do, do we have a volunteer family? A young person that really would like to come up with their parent. Oh, wonderful. All right. And then, Romelin, if you could find one other family, and then we'll wrap this up. All right. Mother, tell us your name and your family name. Let's get this. I'm Jocelyn Ismaher. I'm Janel Jan Ismaher. 11 years old. 11. All right. Could you show us what's in that blue bag? Blue represents in our school lessons history, geography, and prophecy, as well as loyalty and obedience. So what do you have in the bag? An ear. An ear. What does an ear have to do with loyalty and obedience? Ear. A blue. A blue. Hearing. Oh, yes. There's a, there's a lot in the Bible about hearing. Hearing. Another word for obedience is to hear. To hear. And what is that? Cleanliness. Oh, cleanliness. Yes. The blue can remind us of what we cleaning. Yes. We need water, don't we? For the most part, to clean. Water and soap. And that's what God wants us to do. Would you like to take that back to your seat so you can look at it a little closer? You might even want to draw it. We'd love to see your drawing. Okay, thank you for coming up. All right, loyalty. Jesus showed loyalty to his Father. He was obedient to the Ten Commandments. He had an ear to hear what his, the Spirit was telling him. And we want that as well. History, his story. He was loyal. What power was given to Jesus after his resurrection? What power? Let's uh, have the next family come up. The last family to show us what's in the purple bag. <clears throat> Let's see. What kind of power? We're told that he was given all power. And when you see a king, a true king, that king has power over the nation. Um, could you tell us your name and how old you are? Let's start with grandmother. Yeah. Uh, this, I'm Miss Samandre. I'm 82 years old. <laughs> Abby, I'm 10. 10. All right, Abby, thank you. All right, go ahead and pick up the purple bag here and tell us what's in there. What do you see? Oh, it's a ball, isn't it? Actually, it's one of our models. It's a model of the cell. And it's wrapped with gold twine. And in the other hand is what? A globe. A globe. All right. Does God want the whole world to follow him? Yes. He does. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants us all to follow him. And that's why we have the globe. And yet, um, not all will follow. And we have the cell here, a model of the cell. The cell has a nucleus. The nucleus represents the control center of that cell. And we learned this week that our bodies have uh, about 50 trillion cells in the body. And each of those cells needs to be able to control that small little cell so that our body can works, work. So we must be obedient to God's laws in order for that to happen. And so it's wrapped here with gold thread. And I, if we have time, I'd really like for all of us to be united together, holding on to this gold thread. What a symbol that is of being united to Christ, having the gold of faith and love. And if we have his grace, we're also told that gold represents his grace, then we can have the power, like Jesus had power, to do 
um, do what is right. We can have that. We can be joined to divinity, humanity and divinity combined, so that we can follow in the steps of our leader, Jesus. All right, thank you so much. Royalty, that's what gold shows us, is um, we show the world that we are royalty, sons and daughters of God, when we are obedient to him. Philippians 3.20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And um, I have other scriptures to help us to see our lesson uh, all the way to completion. I'm just going to run through um, a few of those and then we're going to end. Acts 2, 22 and 24 tells us, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Jesus holds the keys for us of hell and death. 2 Corinthians 4.10 Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. When we have healthy bodies, we are manifesting Jesus and his glorious character. Luke 16, 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Which reminds us in Revelation, when the sealing takes place, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is just, let him be just still. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11 tells us according to the grace, that gold thread wrapped around that cell, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. What a week we have had spending every day from the time we get up till the time we go to bed thinking about Jesus and what he's done for us in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 58, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? As I was walking on the beach, I found this coral in the shape of a V. Jesus died for us. He was victorious. And because of that, we can receive victory through him. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
Amen. And our last slide. Order is the first law of heaven. The disorder of the world springs from the disorder of man's heart. If your own heart is in the right relation with God, then around your own right living and right acting, the confusion of the world will arrange itself into regularity and peace. May this be, um, come, may this happen in your life. May you receive the peace that comes with following Jesus. The next talk will be by Dr. Boutte. It will be a health talk, and we would like all the children to receive a piece of paper and a pencil, and I will put up here uh, the digestive system along with other organs as Dr. Boutte speaks about the different organs involved in the digestive system we would like the children to draw the digestive system depending of course on their age parents you might help them but um, we would like to see those drawings as well afterwards so I'll be placing the apron up here and um, I'll have a prayer and then we'll, I'm not sure how long we're going to, um, no break, I guess. No. Oh, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. All right, I'll have a prayer and then you'll get further instructions. All right. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for being here with us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that takes the messages that you give to your instruments, the man of clay. Those messages that are from heaven, I pray that the Holy Spirit will burn those upon our hearts so that we will see our need, that we will become meek like the lowly Jesus and follow the shepherd, the true shepherd, Jesus Christ, wheresoever he leads. Thank you so much for loving us and giving us your grace today, the power that is needed to keep your law. In Jesus' name, amen.